At the age of eight, I arrived in Canada with my parents and my two siblings. We had just fled the civil war in Somalia. I was not educated in the Western term of education, but as my mother would tell you, I was wise beyond my years. I spent my days among people that looked like me, spoke the only language I knew, and I was in a country where I felt loved and accepted. I had no idea all that was about to change. Shortly after we arrived, I was enrolled in a French school in Quebec in what they call class d'accueil, meaning welcoming class. However, it was anything but welcoming. You see, those classes are intended for anyone the system is unable to place due to their inability to speak the language. And I knew I belonged there. I felt deaf and mute. I had no words, none. I couldn't even ask to go to the bathroom. And for a child such as myself, who had spent all her days wandering outdoors or sitting under a tree listening to my grandmother tell stories, I was unable to sit all day in a chair just to listen to a teacher I did not understand. And when that teacher allowed us a moment of reprieve to play outdoors, I would sit in the grass and wonder why the son of this country was unable to warm my bones like it did in Somalia. I was bullied constantly by my classmates. I remember kids pulling down my pants, wondering if my blackness extended to the rest of my body. I remember them pulling my hair, thinking that it was fake. And one day, the teacher tied me to the chair with her scarf while accusing me of being too disruptive. I will never forget that day. I felt like a zoo animal in a foreign land expected to perform. Yet, I persevered. I knew what my parents gave up in order for us to have a better life. I struggled to learn the language. And around the age of 10, I began to read. And when that happened, a new world opened up to me. But, and I read all kinds of stories, but I never found myself in any of them that had become a normal occurrence to me. I understood another thing. In this strange land, people tolerated me. My blackness fascinated them. But in their stories, I was not identified. And there was no room for me to tell my own. As I got older, some teachers would recommend books with some semblance of representation. But those books, they were always written by a white author, and they were riddled with so many stereotypical characters, I began to wonder, is this how the world sees me? When they hear Somalia, do they only think of war and famine? And when they see my hijab, do they see me as an oppressed soul who is controlled by her father and soon to be sold to her husband? Those books left me feeling uneasy, to say the least. And then I thought, what if there were books that accurately reflected aspects of my faith and my culture? What if I didn't have to explain why my mother hid her hair, why my, my, my father wore a long beard, why my skin was so dark yet my hair so soft? And I know, for those of you who have never felt the need to explain themselves, that might seem odd. But that's a privilege I've never had. The struggle became more real the day I decided to wear my hijab full time. It had been an excruciating decision that I had been putting off. But when I started high school, I decided it was time. I thus became the most diverse person you could hope to meet. Women, check. Black, check. Muslim, check. Hijabi, check. I had so many identities and so many stereotypes to defend and combat, I didn't even know where to start. And that's the issue I wish to explore today. The seemingly unacknowledged fight and struggles we minorities face. And rather than to cite you the endless atrocities linked to racial and religious profiling displayed in our newspapers and in our medias, I want to bring up the countless small things that are rarely addressed. The pebbles that build mountains. These seemingly small incidences chip away at our identity and force us to ask ourselves each day if the fight is worth it. 
And if you have no idea what I mean, think of how many times you have decided to pronounce our names in a way you see fit because our names are actually too difficult for you. For me, it's when Rahma became Rhonda or when Muhammad turned into Mo so easily. Think of how many times you might have asked an ethnic looking person where they were really from after they told you they were born in Canada. Anytime you might have hired someone in the vein of tokenism. Each time you might have asked your black or Muslim coworker to issue you a blanket statement in all things deem African or Islamic. Anytime you have ignored our presence due to our hijab or skin color, or when those two things spoke to you before we did. Act of racism, they're not always black and white. They're not always easy to identify. But for some of us, they are clear as day. It is not having any diverse books in our libraries or in our classroom. It's our children not seeing themselves reflected when they watch their favorite television show. Or it's when Hollywood force feeds us adaptations of black stories laced with white savior complex. It's white features being promoted, celebrated, and becoming the only standard of what beauty looks like. Now, all of this might seem a little too abstract. Let me give you a personal example. It was summer of 2016, and the movie Frozen was still the craze in all of children's toys. One night, while shopping at Walmart with my daughter, she suddenly spotted something and dashed across the store. She came back with an Elsa hat. Now, the hat was designed to make the owner look like they had the same iconic beach blonde hair of the character. She excitedly said, Mommy, buy me this so I can look beautiful like Elsa. My heart froze, no pun intended. The room stood still, and I realized this is a pivotal moment for my daughter, and I need to send the right message. I knelt down and I asked her, do you feel beautiful without this? She said, yes, but I would be more beautiful if I had hair like Elsa. I took a deep breath and I told her, no, you wouldn't. See, Elsa is a figment of imagination a drawing that came to life at the tip of someone's pen, whereas you were created by the ultimate creator, the one who creates all things. Elsa isn't real, but you are. Elsa could never be what you are. Her beauty lives on the screen of her television, whereas yours radiates no matter where you go. Her voice is computerized, whereas yours is vibrant and powerful. You are infinitely more beautiful than any character drawn by men. As powerful as that was, she didn't understand any of it. <laughs> she was only four after all. But she knew from the tone of my voice and the look in my eye that I meant business. So she put the hat down and walked away quietly. That night, something ignited in me and told me I had to fight for the self-love my daughter required, the very thing that I felt was stolen from me upon my arrival. I refused to let her be sucked in, made feel less than, just because she is not white, blonde hair, or blue-eyed. Now, on top of fighting for representation of people of color as a Muslim, I must also face Islamophobia. This shows up anytime I am randomly selected at the airport. Anytime they ask me to remove my hijab so that they can inspect it. That time when they are, it's being vilified and call a bad mother on Twitter because I showed a picture of my daughter in a hijab on International Hijab Day. It's also being asked if I wear my hijab in the shower or how nice it must be to stay warm in the winter. It's that dreadful feeling at the pit of my stomach whenever an act of violence happens in the media, and I silently pray it is not a Muslim person. And if it is, it's living in fear for the upcoming weeks, knowing that I am wearing the targets some people are seeking to identify me. 
It is being asked to explain Sharia law. It is asking me how a person gets radicalized post-tragedy. But most infuriating of all, it is a need to apologize or to clarify and reassert our love and belonging to Canada. But we are not the representative for those who misuse and defame our religion. So why must we apologize? Now, keeping all of this in mind, I felt compelled to act. Starting with my daughter, I promoted diversity in every media I chose for her. I started reciting daily affirmation to instill in her an unshakable sense of self-confidence. I wanted to give her roots planted so deep they can never be unearthed or replaced. Believing that all children see the, need to see themselves in the books they read, I set out to self-publish children's books featuring black Muslim characters. Now, my characters act as mirrors for those who rarely see themselves in books and windows for others to learn about their life. And most important of all, my books seek to reaffirm that diversity should be celebrated rather than feared. During my school visits, when a child runs up to me and tells me and asks me if I am indeed the author, I get to shatter society caricature of me as the oppressed silent woman. I get to tell them that they too have the power to break the silence, rewrite the narrative, and take their rightful place to tell their own unique story. Now, some of you might be feeling uncomfortable. Know that that's a feeling we bathe in each day, and more work needs to be done. For those of you who consider themselves an ally, I want you to challenge yourself. Do you demand representation of people of color in your books, movies, and toys? And remember, not all representation is equal. Stories should be told from the perspective of those who have lived in. Are you exposing your children to the diverse world they are living in? Are you still asking inappropriate and oftentimes racist questions to your coworker? Remember, it is not incumbent upon us to educate you or hold your hand during these difficult conversations. The emotional labor required is too painful for us. Are you questioning yourself and asking yourself where your information comes from? Do you possess critical thinking that makes you question certain facts? Or are you blindly following the fear-mongering herd? Are you really hearing what people of color are saying? Are you holding space, making room for minority voices to be heard? Do you know when to step down and hand over the mic? Are you amplifying our voices, or are you drowning out our words to fit your own narrative? Most of all, are you using your white privilege in order to advance our cause and concerns, or are you simply trying to explain away and ignore that such a privilege exists at all? I would like to end with this. There's a Sudanese proverb that says, we desire to bequeath two things to our children. The first thing is roots. The second one is wings. To that I add, please do not clip their wings. We have traveled far and wide. We have survived wars and cross oceans just to watch them fly. Thank you.